Good morning. How y'all doing? A little more pep in your stuff than last week. Must be because it's 4-H fair time, right? Um, I've never been invited to more things in my life. I think uh, several of you are being a bit silly or snarky or pointing things out about country music concerts. I'm looking at one right there. Um, I'm glad you thought of me in my moment of what I don't like. Um, but I'm happy you guys are happy and praise God for that. And I've never been invited to see more pigs and cows and things like that in my life. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a disparaging way. Please don't think that whatsoever. I just... It's still getting new, so <laughs> I'm still figuring it out, and, and that's awesome, and I'm glad, and I can see uh, how this town comes together, and I think that's amazing, but 4-H has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about today, so let's pray, and let's get, hey, wait a minute, you know what, July, and I went back and checked your history, is hands down, it's like you're a church attendance, you know, does this thing, and July just goes, like for years, like I, I just... Apparently, like, First Church of God deems it's okay not to, not to worship the Lord on July. And <laughs> that's, I understand you guys got a lot going on. That's not a snarky, backhanded statement. Um, but what I think is so cool is when you got staff gone and people gone, uh, I don't want you to think that uh, Hope leading worship and Kyle stepping up and doing what he did today is the third string. That's the next generation rising up and serving the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. And um, praise God for that because we continue to see more and more people step up and serve the Lord. And that's what this is all about, right? God didn't call you here to save you and sit you. He called you here to save you and move you. Because that's what we're talking about as we continue this series about why be church. Now, a lot of people are like, I know you've got this series right now called Why Go to Church. You missed the point completely, okay? That has absolutely nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, last week at the end, I came up debunking the entire nursery rhyme. Mother Goose has failed you and led you astray once again, okay? So what I want us to understand, and just kind of a backlog of last week, we, we were in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, and we kind of got through like the first 16 verses. Don't go there, it's okay. But I want, I, it's important because last, uh, yesterday was the lowest attended day of the year. Uh, it was actually 105 less people than the day before. And I understand it's 4th of July weekend, so it's, I think it's good to bring you up to speed a little bit, okay? So what you need to know is when we say why be church is because if you go through all the epistles in the New Testament, okay, Paul, Peter, James, all the writers of the New Testament, when they're writing their epistles, their letters, they, you know, offer the same general greeting, okay? And so yesterday, uh, or last Sunday, we talked about when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, and he says, Paul, servant of the gospel, called by the Jesus Christ our Lord, and he says, to the ecclesia of Theos, okay? In Theos, to Theos, sorry. In Greek, the ecclesia to Theos, the church of God, or church is not even a word. It's the called out people of God, okay? Paul would never write a letter to a building, yet all of us continue to call this building what? What do we call it? A church. And there's a Lutheran what right over there? Church. And there's a Methodist what two blocks down? Church. Okay? That's what we call it. But if we continue to call a building a church, that makes Paul's epistles and John's epistles and Peter's epistles sound, they make it sound silly. Who writes a letter to a building? Nobody. Oh, no. Then, do you? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Nobody writes a letter to a building. We write a letter to a people. And the ecclesia, of the called out, are the people of God. Now, why are you called out? Well, it's really important for us to understand. You are called out of the community to be what? Stewards of the community. 
That is what you are called out of, is to be stewards of your community. And then we also know, as we are called out people to be stewards of our community, we also know that they were identified as people who were holy, who were different, okay? And they were identified to be different. Holy in Greek, hagias, means to be set aside. And I said, do people know you go to church or do people know you are the church? Okay? It's one thing that people would know you are different. And then we know that they are to be a people of forgiveness. And sadly, over the last 50 years, the church has gained a horrible reputation for not being what we preach. We preach forgiveness. Amen? But without the forgiveness of the cross, we got nothing. Amen? And so, for whatever reason, forgiveness has not been working for us. And we need to understand that as the called out, God has an expectation of us to be set aside and to be different. And not just set aside and different, but also marked by being people of forgiveness. People who extend grace. Jesus said, to who but much has been given, the same loveth much. I have given you much grace. I have given you much mercy. I have given you much forgiveness. That is why you have salvation through me. So the one thing I ask is that you love people the way I have loved you. And the moment the church, ecclesia, stops doing that is when the ecclesia dies. But no building has a soul. No building has a spirit. No building can sin. No building can offend God. Unless maybe it's got like an upside down cross on it or something like that. That's not possible. Only the church, the people can do that. And then he goes on to say and identify the church more as that we have a new home in Christ. Your home as the ecclesia is not in this building. This is a place of gathering. You need to understand that. A gathering of the saints to lift each other up. But our home isn't our house. Our home isn't in this building. Our home is in Christ Jesus. That is where our home is. That is where we reside. And then we talked about how people have been, as the ecclesia, they've been fully enriched. They got everything they want. And for a lot of us out there, to put this in a, a layman's terms, it's like you got the best Manny Petty you've ever wanted in your life. It's like you got to go to Bloomingdale's and buy everything you ever wanted to buy. And if you're a guy, it's like getting the best 4x4 truck you ever needed with the gun rack and every gun you ever wanted, the best fishing pole. You went to Dick's or whatever that other uh, Caballos is, and you got everything out there that filled your man card with checks, check, 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 check. You were fully enriched. And we talked about how for us to be fully enriched by the Spirit of God sometimes isn't enough. And we know this by the data we see in America because we know the average home in America has $15,500 in debt. To what? Enrich yourself with stuff to make you feel better. But yet, God's Word says you've been fully enriched in Him. And finally, as the church, we know we've been gifted. Every one of you has a special, unique gift setting to be an active force within the community and to be good stewards of the community. Some of you are not going to get up front and talk. I know that you would sooner have a heart attack on the spot than get up here and do this. I get it. Okay? But some of you feel really called to go play with little kids. I got two little kids. That's the last thing I want to do. Okay? And some of you feel like you want to greet people. I run and hide because I have a very public job. Okay? Going to Miller's is like the most terrifying thing in the world to me because I'm afraid I won't recognize a face and then I'll hurt somebody's feelings. Okay? We all have a different gift and those gifts are meant to go out and be stewards of the community. So, how do we do that here right now? A great example is that Elijah Haven box. And I, we made it in the first service, but you need to know this right now. Okay? I have put a challenge out to the first service. I put this challenge out to you because they asked me, the local missions team asked me to do this. And this is a good way to show that the church is truly the stewards of the community. Big old picture in the paper of the bank. They gave, raised money for Elijah's Haven for like $1,000 $132. And so the, the home missions team called me and they said, Ben, would you put a stupid hat on and take a picture in the newspaper? That is the last thing I want to do, okay? But truly, if you know me, I'm fine up here. You put me in public, I'm terrified. Panic attack and everything, okay? Because I can control you, 
Not, not really. But <laughs> All right, but I really don't like that. But I got to thinking about it. I said this. I said, if the church can raise more money than a bank, that would make a statement, wouldn't it? Now, I know a lot of you work for the bank, so you've given money over there. Good for you. But let's empty our pockets and give $1,233 to show that the church is wealthier than the world. We have a God who has the cattle on a thousand hill. Amen? We have abundant life. And God is always faithful to giving back to you what you give to Him. So let's be that shining light in the community. How many of you as a church would love to be the bank? I would. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I would. So don't just put in a buck. Put in five. I broke this thing down. At this point right now, if we just had 10 people that gave $50, it'd be over, and we could go, ha, ha, ha. If we're like, or if many people just gave 20 okay, we could still go, ha, ha, ha. I just am really afraid that they're not going to give me a hat. They're going to shave my head, and my ears will fly away. I will fly away. Okay. That's what the church is. So here we are today. Then if we are a people, we are a church, Church, then what are we called to do? And so this week we're going to talk about being called to worship. Now, disclaimer, worship is not just music, okay? We, just like we use the church word church in a very myopic sense, a very closed-minded sense, a very deluded sense, the word worship also has very much become that way. See, worship, certainly singing is a part of worship, but so is prayer, so is testimony, so is tithing, so is uh, sharing of the word, so is somebody standing up and sharing a, a prophetic word, so is uh, somebody standing up and laying hands on people, so is anointing people with oil. There are many aspects of worship, and I don't want to boil it down, but let's just stick with the term singing today as worship. Okay? So I do understand that there are many aspects of worship, but let's just focus on music today. And there's a reason I want to focus on music today, because of the condition of our world as we find it right now. We are more divided, and we are on a powder keg. And if you haven't watched the news, you have no idea what I'm talking about. We are right on the cusp of 1969, and you better get ready. We are divided. This nation is divided. Call it what you want, but something bad is about to happen. Now, I'll arrive at that at the end, but now let me back up. Ben, how does worship have to do with all this hatred amongst different people groups in the world? From the moment I became a Christian, 15 years later to where I am now, there is no part of a congregation or the capital C church that I have found to be more divisive and cause more splits than worship. Okay? I will start from the very beginning. I'm in work release. On Sundays, I can go to a local church, okay, over in Goshen. And I went there. They were a fundamental Bible church. And most of you have heard this part. Now, here was the thing that happened, okay? You, you have to put yourself in my mindset, okay? I'm driving from work release to this fundamental Bible church. Fundamental. And we go in, and inside this church, we go in, they... They preach these sermons that I way over my head, okay? But then they would have this, this music, okay? And, and the only thing I can think of calling it is vibrato music, okay? There's no such term as vibrato music. It was just this lady that got up, and she had no instrument, and she'd just go like, and, and quite frankly, they're looking at me like I'm crazy in the window. Quite frankly, it freaked me out. I was just like, it's just like, chance of a coven? Like, what is this? Now, I know that. That church loved me. That church was always had my back. That church was always with me. But clearly, that wasn't a fit for me. Because every time I drove to the church, I was listening to Pantera, Metallica, you know, <laughs> GNR, all these other things. They're like, welcome to the jungle! We have fun and games! I go into, whoa, whoa! 
what is this? So finally, my friend's like, man, you got to come check out my congregation. So I go from fundamental Bible church with, ah, 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 and then I go into this, this mega seeker church. And I walk in, and it's like going to Disneyland. I mean, you walk in, and people are smiling. I don't know if they gave these people a massive amount of Prozac. I don't know what they gave them, but they were the happiest folks in the world. They shook your hand. You walked in. I felt like I was going to a spa. I was ready to get a mani-pedi. I was just like, woo hoo 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 And they had comfy seats, and everything went on. And then they started singing, or what we call worship, and started seeing people do this. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Now for a dude like me, that's not the kind of thing I tend to do. As a matter of fact, I kind of took a two-step to the side and thought, this, for lack of a better term, doesn't seem manly. And I know that sounds horrible, but that's where I was 15 years ago. It just give me some grace on knowing that's how immature of a believer I was. So as time moved on, I was like, why do people keep raising their hands? Why are they not, why, why are they not just sing, afraid to sing out loud? Because to me, this was just weird and awkward. It made no sense to me. And so I went on this journey. I finally decided because the fundamentalists told me these people were going to hell. And these people told me the fundamentalists were going to hell. And I just all of a sudden decided, okay, you guys raise your hands and sing. And you guys sing vibrato music. But then you're telling me all these other Christians are going to hell. Even though we all believe they're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. You say they're your brothers and sisters. But in a corner you go, not really. And then they come over here, and it's always about worship style. So finally, I decide to go out, and I start to see these charismatic. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Okay? Oh, yeah, they're definitely going to hell because they're filled with the demon spirit. Okay? So I go into there, and I start seeing these people. I mean, they are running in circles like, woo! People's waving banners. <laughs> I'm just like, my goodness. And I, I slowly started to realize that these people love Jesus Christ, and yet they were very passionate about how they went after God. And it was so sad that we, as the called out, secretly were throwing rocks at each other. Secretly were saying, we have the right formula. The moment you have the right formula is when you're in the throne room of God. So stop throwing rocks at each other. Fast forward. 15 years later, I, be, I think I become a little more mature, a little more enlightened, a little more open-minded, if you will, and I start becoming a hand raiser. And, uh, crazy, right? So, <laughs> I'm a hand raiser. And um, to take the job I have with my former ministry to take on corporate leadership, I had to be a confirmed Missouri Synod Lutheran. And the, they are a very strict People. I mean, women can't vote. They're, you know, sit on two sides of the church. You know, they're just very strict. It's not like what I came out of. And uh, we had to attend one of those congregations. Well, we found one that had contemporary worship. On the other side, they had traditional worship. They actually had the best balance I've ever seen in my life. Do you know they had six services? Three liturgical, three contemporary. Now, Contemporary for Lutherans is a little bit more than contemporary for church downtown Atlanta or downtown Nashville or, you know, where the Bible Belt's really big, okay? They're playing like songs we heard 15 years ago, and my wife, who can sing, gets on the praise team, and she's up there, and she's smiling, and she starts, like, clapping, okay? That, like, right there was just, like, she's clapping. What's going on? And so she's... 1,000, 1,500 people in the crowd. One claps. It's got to be me, right? So, <laughs> I, I, we go in again, and, you know, I feel like I got to be there. I got to worship my God. I got to do the way I feel led to do. And so I remember, and I don't know, baby, if you remember this, but we were sitting there, and one day I've got my hand in the air, and I'm singing out loud. You know, I can't remember what song it was, and all of a sudden you got to do the awkward handshake. You all know what I'm talking about. Greet the people next to you. And this poor lady who's been stuck next to me with my hands in the air, screaming and singing, comes over to me, and she goes, 
you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> and the point is, and what I want us to get before I go into this, okay, is we don't want to let these things divide us. My hope today is not to tell you the right way to worship, because there is no prescripted right way to worship. The only true way that Jesus said is you will worship me in spirit and in truth. So I hope today to just show you two things. What is true spirit worship and what is the power of worship when that happens? So turn with me in Acts 16. Now a little background to this. Paul's on his second missionary journey. And as he's on his second missionary journey, he has decided to take uh, Silas and Timothy with him. And he's gone out, and they've been traveling around. And he's really wanted to go in Asia, but it actually says in the text that he is led to go into this Roman area called Philippi. Now, Philippi might sound a bit familiar to you because Philippi is the town of the Philippians where you get the book, the epistle in the New Testament called what? Philippians, okay? So he got that letter because he went here to establish a church, and this is how he got there. Now, he has come in, and he's come into Philippi. Remember, Roman colony, okay? No Jews there. He's called now to go as a Jewish person to go be a minister to these Roman Gentiles in a Roman Gentile area. And as he goes out, he goes out and he meets these people, one lady named Lydia of influence. He shares the word of God with her. The Bible says the Holy Spirit opened her heart. She became saved, came, became no Lord, and said, hey, why don't you come hang out with me so we can set up camp here, and we'll go out, and you can go out and continue your ministry. And that's where we pick up in verse 16. So he, we've seen Lydia saved, Paul and Silas are staying there, and now pick up in verse 16. Once when we, we includes the author Luke. So Luke, Silas, Timothy, Paul. Once we were going to the place of prayer. Right there. We know there is no synagogue. Okay? We know there is no house of worship. There's just a place of prayer. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her, owner, for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said it to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. And when the owners of this slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into a marketplace to face the authorities. And they brought them before the magistrates and said, these these men are Jews, and they are throwing the city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack, and Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Then he had them severely flogged, then thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving this order, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Okay, the first thing I need you to understand right now of what a true spirit of worship is, is the fact that God is not a respecter of your comfort, your time, and appeasing you. Now, most church leaders in America would never admit this, but their strategy, nine times out of ten, when they go plant a church or they're trying to help a church grow, is to accommodate the lost to make you feel super comfortable. Think about it. Think about the newer congregations you see in the world. They build the best buildings there are. They look like play palaces. They make sure that you have comfortable seating where you can have your 32-ounce Mountain Dew beverage and that you can relax and some of them have reclined. And they make sure you say all the right words. And they make sure that you're dressed a certain way. And they make sure that all the timing is impeccable because they got to get more and more people in, more and more going on. And all these must, 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 because they got to get it right, 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 to make people feel comfortable and not offend them. 
And that's fine. I'm not against that. I think that's strategic thinking. But if you get wrapped up in that, you get wrapped up in the idea that the world is shaping the church. Because the world is saying, accommodate to me. That's the mindset in America today. Accommodate to me. Make me happy. And slowly, do you see Christians being what? Impacted by this world that says, make me comfortable. Make me feel good. They're worried about the right seats, the right place, the right talk. And all of a sudden, if you get too focused on that, you forget about the right what? Spirit. And it's very easy to get in that mindset. It's extraordinarily easy to get in that mindset. We had a friend visit last week. And uh, he, they're from Atlanta, okay? And they were here and we went out to eat. And uh, this dude in a mega, 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 mega church in Atlanta. Montel Jordan, this is how we do it. He's their leader. He's their worship leader. Truly. I was in his office one day playing with his platinum record, and they're about to take a selfie and kind of tipped it on the wall. He's like, last guy who did that, he charged about $1,000 to. So I got out. Okay, but that's the kind of church it is. We in the car, and I was like, what do you think of our congregation? He's like, first off, loved it. Second off, we could never say what you said. Not at all. I'm like, what? He's like, you can't say anything that you said about Republicans, Democrats, about any of that. You can't talk about any of these things anymore. We can't talk about that. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's weird. <laughs> like, I, is that where Christianity has become? That you can't call a spade a spade? You can't call a lie a lie? You can't call sin sin? And then, I'll give you another example about how here, okay, because I don't want to paint others as bad and us as good. We have our own problems too, okay? I remember about, I don't know, a month or two ago when I got up one morning and I had no clean clothes. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? It's hard with a two and a three-year-old. Can I get an Amen. Amen. And two worrying family. It's hard, okay? And then you guys are like, well, pastors only work on Sunday. What else are you going to do? Okay? <laughs> Clearly not laundry. So I wake up and I'm like, okay, I intentionally am not going to wear a suit, okay? But my clothes are sweaty, dirty, old, and wrinkly, and I'm not going to bother my wife who's been painted with makeup as my kids run around in diapers. I'm not going to bother her. So I have a decision to make. Do I wear my normal street clothes and get up and speak because that's what a lot of contemporary churches do, or do I worry about offending some people who just ex still expect me to be in a suit? This was a, a weighted question. Da, na, 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 na. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to battle this. I'm going to put on a dirty, wrinkly, smelly, sweaty shirt and old, dirty, smelly dress pants. And I'm going to get up and I'm going to preach. And anyone who hugs me and complains about my stench, that gives me an end to talk about maybe we got to put our focus on something else. Okay? So <laughs> when we worry about doing all these right things, we forget about a right spirit. That's when we miss the true spiritual worship of God. When we worry about trying to create an environment for the Spirit of God to move, you will fail. You don't control God. You can't make God work. God makes you work. The Spirit within you makes you work. But somehow, delusionally, we, th we think if we move all the right pieces together on the puzzle and we get the Rubik's Cube right, we throw it on the table, we go, ha! God will move. I assure you that won't happen. I said, you know, I don't want to push my agenda here, but I said, same logic the other day. I saw somebody say this gun control thing, and, and the best statement I ever heard was this guy threw a gun on the table. He goes, shoot people. Kill. Kill. Dumb people kill people, not guns. And so I'm, I'm not pushing my agenda, but it's kind of the same thing. If you think you're putting your whole equation together, you think God's going to show up, you're wrong. Because God is not a respecter of time, and he's not a respecter of comfort. Where are they at right now? Where are Paul and Silas? They're in prison. They are in prison. And they didn't just go to prison. Before they went to prison, what happened? They were beaten, they were flogged, stripped naked, publicly humiliated, then put into prison and stocked ankles and feet on the wall. 
This is not a convenient place. This is not what we would expect people to have a worship service. This is no way how America thinks. And yet these people are doing what? They are singing to God and praising Him. And it says other people noticed. Too many times in America, the church has made this formula and we have forgotten we can't control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows up when we make the best of a bad situation. People are sick and tired of your t-shirts and your Bible handout tracks. They don't want to see it anymore. They want to see how we respond during trial. And they don't want to see us up preaching megaphones of hate. They don't want to see rednecks on YouTube preaching about unisex bathrooms. They don't want to see that. Do you know what they want to see? They want to see love. Yeah. There's too much hate. Don't tell me there's not. If I, can we pull up the news right now? Pick whatever station you want. Don't do it. You're going to see hate. You are going to see people literally pit people against one another. Don't you, all of the, okay, I'm just going to go with the fact that we're still in a very conservative area and in a conservative church. And I know that's not everybody in the room, okay? So just go with me, okay? Don't you think that Fox News for one minute is telling you the truth? They're not trying uh, now, I think they're, I, I tend to watch them more, okay? But don't you think for a minute they're not trying to make money? Don't you think for a minute that they're not playing on hatred and fear and discord and everything else out there? I watch them pit everybody together and they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight. And they fight. You want to know why? Because people pay attention when people fight. But do you want to know when people pay more attention? When people love. What if they had people to get up and give loving discourses? What about that? Did you see the one man who said, I went down to be a part of this protest, and once I saw the shooting, I came back and had a revelation. Did you guys see that guy in the news? And everybody was like, this guy needs to be president. He went out as a Black Lives Matter and came out as, oh my gosh, this is not what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of an All Lives Matter movement. Because God loves people. When we respond in midst of trial, that's when people were paying attention. When these guys were here, notice what they didn't say. Because we in America think if we do something good, God has this system of reciprocity. You do good, God will give back to you. These guys were faithful to doing exactly what God called them to do. And what did they get out of it? They didn't get a golden toilet. They didn't get a big old mansion. They didn't get a big old win. They got put in prison and humiliated. And instead of blaming God, instead of second-guessing God, they stood up and they what? Praised God. And who noticed? The other prisoners. The other people hurting notice when you respond when bad things happen. Do you want to go to a party where people are miserable? Or do you want to go to a party when people are sincerely happy? Where do you want to be? I want to be where people are sincerely happy. And yet, that's the mindset. They don't blame. They don't get angry. They don't fuss. They don't fight. They don't go, oh, I can't sing. Oh, God, why did you put me here? They say, praise God and let's pray. And that becomes the spirit of true praise and worship. That is the spirit of worship. It's a spirit that says it's not about getting what I want. I thank God for giving me what I need. And if I need to be here right now, I choose to say thank you. And a lot of us need to cultivate this idea that says when bad things happen and you've been doing good for God, it doesn't mean God's not good. Sometimes He allows the bad things to happen so you continue to press into Him. The greatest strategy Satan has to hold you back is this. He gives you a win and you stop pushing. That's the greatest strategy he has. But what if God gave you something good and you kept pushing? What if God gave you something good and you went the extra mile? Beloved, there's never a speed bump on the extra mile. You keep pushing. What if you did that? Here's what happens when you do that, okay? 
Because when we take this idea out of the world that we're owed something, and we move that out, and we thank God for what we have despite our circumstances, and that means you have to take this mindly world set out of you. That's what it is. God will do amazing things. I have only twice in my life seen a true movement of the Holy Spirit where it was like unfathomable. I mean, can't explain it. Uh, intense. I, I just, I wish I could put words on it. Um, we were at a church in Alabama. Typical night, typical day. Not typical. I mean, we just went through the motions. There was nothing there. I didn't pray for God to show up. I didn't try to set pieces in motion. I just got up and gave the message and all the kids were there. One of the worst kids in the youth group who constantly caused problems gets up and starts walking. And I think they're just walking to be a problem or whatever. I'm about to yell. But they, instead of walking to the door, they keep walking up front. And I'm thinking, what are they doing? And they walk up front and I'm ready to go home because I'm tired. My mind isn't focused on God. It's focused on the world. This person comes up, stands in front of a microphone. No ask. No altar call, no plea, didn't even bring it. I don't know, other than the spirit of the living God, brought this person up. And this person just looked everybody in the face, doesn't know anyone in the room hardly, and says this. He says, I've been a fake. I've been a sinner. Let me tell you what I've done. And they just listed off. Didn't ask. I mean, and now you've got a problem because they've confessed some really bad sins. And you're kind of like, oh, didn't expect that, didn't plan that. What do I do? And so we kind of sat. All of a sudden, another kid comes up. He starts talking about all the heinous things going on at his home and all his sin and asking God for forgiveness. And after about the seventh person, all of a sudden, like somebody just gets up and prompts and starts playing guitar. And all of a sudden, kids are falling down and praying. And I know this doesn't sound normal to you guys because that's, that it doesn't make us feel comfortable. But people are literally laying on the ground and praying. And this goes on for hours. Hours. I have never seen a movement of God like that. They weren't worried about the world. They weren't worried about time. They weren't worried about what other people thought about them. These are teenagers that typically want to go home and play Xbox that would rather sit on their face and weep and cry and ask God for forgiveness. I couldn't have made it happen. And do you know who killed the movement? The church leaders. They got to go home. Parents are getting angry. Let them get angry. These are the next generation of the church stuck in a movement of God. And you're going to crush that to be on time. When we put a prescription on being in the presence of God, all you've done is manufactured emotion and nothing more. When we say we have to go because it's 1230 and that's when this service should end and God forbid the Holy Spirit fall down and all of a sudden all of us sit here in the presence of God and feel like we need to fall on our face and don't think that doesn't happen, read the Bible. That happens over and over and over. Old and New Testament. Watch every time John is standing in the throne room of God throughout the book of Revelation. He never stands up and goes, wow, that is dope. There's rainbows and flying lions and all this stuff. He falls on the ground. In the presence of God can be terrifying because we realize that we are infinitely small and sinful. But yet, the counterbalance to that is there's no better place to be is in the presence of our Savior. And the point to getting there is very simple. It's ridding yourself of the mindset that you can, one, make Him work, and two, that He owes you this. God will show up. God will move if you simply move the selfishness out of yourself. That's when you'll feel it. That's when you'll see it. Now the second part is where I think we really as a church need to grasp. Pick up in verse 26. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that uh, to the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once... The prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. 
We are here. And the jailer called the lights. And he rushed and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour and the night, the jailer took them and he washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized. Now, the next point of worship by having the spirit of worship is understanding this. If you have a true spirit of worship, not a sense of entitlement, not a sense of making people comfortable to manufacture what happens, but a spirit that says God will move in my life and I won't put limitations on how that works and all I want is for you to be in my life, nothing else to make me happy but your spirit and you gather together with a whole lot of people and you start singing God shows up and when God shows up, do you know what happens? God does miracles. Do you believe He does miracles? I do. It says He caused an earthquake. And then when the earthquake happened, the jail door, what? Opens up. Now, who was afraid? The jailer. The jailer was afraid. And what could Paul and Silas have done? They could have ran, right? They, and what, did the, what was the jailer's response? I'm going to kill myself because the inevitable, I'm going to die. How many of you have jailers in your life? People that you strive for them to like you? People who put you down? People who speak negative over you? Whether it's family or friends? You have people that put you in an emotional prison? Could be a spouse, could be anybody. We have those people in our lives. And how many of us would stop to think when I sing and I praise God at the hardest time of my life and God shows up and gives me a chance to run, I'm going to turn around and love the person who's been trying to jail me. There's a lot of people in my life that try to jail me. There's a lot of people in my life that try to tell me how I'm supposed to act, how I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to do. And they become jailers if I let them. But I refuse to let them. But understand this, I also refuse to hate them, and I also refuse to let them kill themselves. I will not allow that to happen. Jesus said, what? Don't just love your neighbor and those who it's easy to like. Love your enemy. Even the pagans love those who it's easy to like. Love those who aren't like you. That's the power of God. It's not the earthquake. The power of God is that Paul and Silas had the restraint to stand and want this person to come to know Jesus Christ. The person that was there to hurt them, the person that was there to paralyze them, the person that was there to keep them in a paralysis, they turned around and freed him. That's what the power of worship does. A jailer and a prisoner are two different people, right? Two different, ti two different ti titles, two different people groups. You, you follow me? But what happens? They're brought what? Together. The power of praise and the power of worship and the true spirit of God truly brings unity. It brings people together. And I'll, I'm going to close on this illustration where I've seen this firsthand. When I was with Bethesda, we, uh, when, when they have build big buildings and they do new things, they have installation services. And we had built this big new building and I was coming in and I was being installed. And it's very high church. It's liturgical and, you know, they incense and chants and anointing you with oil and all this stuff. And we knew this was going to be a big deal. I mean, the board was going to be there. There was going to be like 200 people there from the Missouri Synod. It was a big deal. And after that, there was going to be a fundraiser. Well, we did things a little different down there. And so we were down there. We were trying to think, like, how can we have this fundraising dinner and make it different and put our flavor on things? Because we just weren't that type of people. And so we said, oh, let's bring in United in Christ. Now, that might mean nothing to you. Okay? But United in Christ is an all African American church. And their mantra is denominations are an abomination. 
Where the Lutherans are like, our denomination completely and fully defines who we are. So that all of a sudden, what sounded like a really neat idea of blending everybody together, and we all touch toes and sing kumbaya and everything else, all of a sudden when you took a step back, you went, this is not a recipe for any kind of good chili. Okay, <laughs> this can only go down bad. So it's already set in place. And we said, okay, let's go meet with Pastor Jay pastor of United in Christ Church. So I sat down with Pastor Jay and I said, Pastor Lewis, I know you don't like being told what to do and I know your philosophy of the Holy Spirit. And I said, but I gotta ask you to do a few things, okay? Understand your audience. Sounds smart, right? That's what we say professionally. If you run a business, understand your customer. Understand your audience. These are all white, Norwegian, German descent people that, that, that sing hymns and do liturgy. They, do, they don't know your loudness. They don't know your charismaticism. They don't know your fist pumping and screaming and dancing. They don't know this. And so, could you please not say a few things? And I'm like, one, don't say denominations are abominations. Two, why don't you keep the music low? Three, he goes, let me stop you there, Pastor. Are you asking me to be a leader of the Lord and the Holy Spirit? Are you asking me to be your monkey boy? What do you Okay. I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry. Let, let me explain something to you. Because we've been friends for a long time. I never heard this story. And he said, uh, do you know what the greatest sin in my life is? And I said, no. I don't. I'm afraid of you right now because I've offended you. <laughs> and uh, he said, it's racism. I grew up hating white people. He said, do you know I got hit with the fire hose in Birmingham? And I was raised there and I was right there. I saw it all. I saw... First Street Baptist Church, blown up. I've seen those pieces. I remember that day. And my family got me out of Birmingham and they moved us to Anderson thinking by moving north, it would get better. In the first week as I was driving, riding my bike down Anderson, right across the street were three white boys. And I didn't think nothing of it and I was riding my bike and all of a sudden I heard them say, get out of here, in, And I heard a thud and they had taken a full pop can and thrown it and hit him in his ear and he went permanently deaf. Now he thought he got away from that. He said, then I spent the next years hating white people. For 20 years, I hated white people. And then all of a sudden I had to worship in a white church when my church closed down. And the Lord told me, you have to repent to have a true spirit of worship. What I was talking about earlier. And he said, ever since I've repented of that, God has shown me that we have a, a ministry to connect all races. So why don't you trust me that I'm going to flow with the Holy Ghost? Okay. That, that even kind of right. <laughs> So a little scared. You remember the ride there? We go to this big luxurious dinner, you know, ice sculptures, fancy food, everything, you know, schmoozing and all this stuff, big donors. And we're sitting at the uh, second table. My wife, myself, one of the biggest donors to the ministry, the executive vice president, the treasurer of our board, and Pastor Jay, who had been deafened in his ear. And then 200 and some staunch white Lutherans. And he, he and his uh, group, his singing group, had these really fancy suits on. You know what I mean? Like, they just, that, that's their culture. That's how it was. I mean, they, they were really fancy and shiny. Well, I, God bless this lady who was trying to do the right thing. She's like, my, that's nice. Did you make it yourself? Like, pet again. I'm like, oh gosh, this is only going to get worse. And you could see him just, mm, mm. And I'm thinking, this, this is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. So then finally it's time for them to get up and sing. And the vice president of development, in front of all these people, says, uh, religious life director Ben Stuckey has invited his, his friends from United in Christ Church to get up and provide musical entertainment tonight. And then the executive vice president turned around to me and said, oh, these are your friends? And I went, oh gosh. It's all down here from there. My career is destroyed. And all I'm praying at this point is don't sing I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Don't sing I am a friend of God. Because it just starts loud. I mean, it's like, ah! 
And I'm like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Just sing, you know, really quiet, sing hymns, do this. And sure enough, boom, went the track, and ah! Clap your hands! Clap your hands! Come on, clap your hands! And I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going on? What is going on? What is going on? And the executive vice president gets up and walks away. And I'm like, oh my goodness, my career is over. And they just keep going and going. And at this moment, I realize something, okay? Because they are singing and they have no agenda. They've confessed their sins. They know who they are and they know what they're called to do. And their call in life is to bring people together by praising our God. And they are not ashamed to do it. And so they keep singing louder and louder and they, they're not backing down and these Icelandic Norwegian Germans are mm, I mean if you fed them prune juice it wouldn't help and so as they're doing this I feel this sense of obligation to my friend I'm like I guess I gotta stand up and raise my hand so I'm like oh lord I'm gonna get fired it's like I was raising my hand to get fired and I'm like oh I am a friend of God uh, and then one other person stands up and I think my wife stood up and so there's three of us and the three white people in the room like this and they're just singing and finally the dude just said stop he said let me ask you a question do you believe in Jesus can you get an amen and they're like that's not a big thing for them so I amen he goes okay let's try this one more time how many of you have stubbed your toe before and they all raised their hand he goes did you yell and people kind of laughed. He goes, seriously, did you yell? And did you yell the name of the Lord or a swear word? How many of you have done that before? So, you will yell when you slam your toe, but you can't sing for our risen Lord. Are we together or aren't we? And all of a sudden, he goes, let's do it again. And they started. And all of a sudden, the CEO's wife runs right out in front. And she starts dancing like David. I think if she took her clothes off, I thought, oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> and slowly, one by one, all these white people who have never participated in anything, they look like Steve Martin in The Jerk. You guys ever seen that movie before? I mean, they're just like... <laughs> but by the end, by the end, Black, white, Lutheran, non. At the last song, we're all pumping their fists, dancing and singing for Jesus Christ. You want to see this foolishness stop? You want to see innocent people stop dying? Let's start worshiping. And let's not watch TV and make snarky comments. Let's not watch TV and go, well, I'm not a racist. Why? Because you don't say the N-word in public? You think you're not a racist? Get honest with yourself. Do a check. Ask yourself. That's just saying, I'm not a racist by default. What are you doing to proactively fix it? What are you doing to unite other people? What are you doing to help bring everybody together? You know what? It's real simple. Let's continue to be the called out people. And when we're called out, let's not point our fingers at other people and call out how they're different. Let's point our fingers up and call out unto the one who unifies us. And when we call out to him and we praise him and his power comes down, only then will the church come together. And we won't be split by buildings. We'll be one in spirit. And listen to me now. The church is the wealthiest institution in the world and it is on fire and it is unhappy. So let's get happy. Let's Let's get loving, let's get moving, let's get going. And I assure you of this, the government will not fix this problem. These candidates get up and they feed and demagogue on what's happening and I'm tired of it. I'm ready for us to be the solution. The question is, do you want to be? Because that's what I want. I'm tired of being divisive. I'm tired of hatred. I'm tired of finger pointing. I'm tired of all of it. Why can't we do what Kyle said? Let's walk in love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.
God, we come to you today, and um, it doesn't matter how we go about worshiping you. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us a spirit that would connect with yours. I pray, Lord, that everybody in this room would feel your presence, O oh God. I pray, as you said you sent your Holy Spirit as a comforter, that you comfort us, but also comfort us in a way when trials come in our life, we truly can praise you. Help us to have a spirit of worship, not just here in this building, but as we go about our lives every single day. Help us to have a spirit of praise on our lips with those people we don't like. Help us to respond in love when so much hate is out there. Help us to stop trying to manufacture you and start embracing where you move, God. Move continuously throughout this country. We pray for the whole church in this country to stand up and love our neighbor as we love ourself. Help us to love as you have loved us. Help us to walk in love when it's not easy to like. Help us extend that grace so we can be the catalyst, the city shining on a hill, the people called out to preach your love and your gospel for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. I don't know about you, but it is hot for me. So stand up. It's a good day. Amen. All right, so I don't know about how many of you, but maybe you're going to the 4-H fair. Maybe you're eating hot dogs. I don't know what you're doing. Um, but we're going to go out, amen? We're going to go love people. We're going to be the church, amen? So let's say it together as we learn our stuff. Oh, hold on. Let's say it together as we debunk the nursery rhyme of we started this last week. You were all taught this as a child. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the door. See all the people. Mother Goose has lied to you. What is the church? The church is the people. Right? You are the church. Where are we? We are called out people. To call us a building is to render us feeble. So let's say that. We are the church. A called group of people. To call us a building is to render us feeble. Raise your hands and receive a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with favor. And may the Lord grant you his peace. Go, brothers and sisters, and have a wonderful day.